I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. We have a saying here on Marketing Trends. Marketing is meant to be remarkable. But what exactly does that mean? Does that mean marketing is great customer service? Or maybe remarkable marketing is advertising that sticks with you? Rob Wiley, the CMO of Cherubundi, gives his take on what remarkable marketing actually is. The best, fastest way to make remarkable things is via innovation, meaning identifying what consumers really want or need and catering to that in a meaningful and impactful way. Now, not every brand can do that, but I think if you start with the consumer, you're headed very quickly in the right direction. I think the wrong direction what you see a lot of larger companies do is innovate from the supply chain. What can we make more of? What can we make better of? Does anybody even want more or better of that thing? And what that makes for is a lot of unremarkable products. On this episode of Marketing Trends, Rob takes a stand on why marketers should stop focusing solely on ads and instead start aligning themselves with their brand's views. Rob also dives into how Cherubundi launched a rebrand of its product in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic by developing a better understanding of their power users and leaning into the strategies that separate Cherubundi from its competitors. Enjoy this episode. This message is brought to you by Salesforce. Hey marketers, today's B2B buyers are more complex than ever, and every buying committee has different needs and goals. Salesforce can help. We'll show you how to put each and every customer at the center of your B2B marketing strategy, and you'll learn how top brands like Lyft approach account-based marketing. Salesforce, market to every account, speak to every buyer. Find free B2B marketing and ABM resources at sfdc.co slash every dash buyer. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, host of Marketing Trends, and today we are joined by special guest, Rob, how are you? I'm great. Ian, how are you, buddy? I'm doing very well. Excited to have you on the show uh, to talk about all the amazing stuff that you're doing at Cherubundi and your background. So let's get into it. How'd you get started in marketing? I came to marketing through most of the conventional ways of the early 2000s, which is via advertising. So I went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, left Chapel Hill, thinking that, you know, what I wanted to do was work in a creative industry and advertising agencies in New York were the biggest kind of coolest thing to be doing. And so that's where I went. Uh, I I lived in New York for about six years working at a number of agencies, uh, specifically larger global agencies working on large brands. And that gave me a lot of exposure to how big brands go to market, specifically sort of at the advent of the internet, which was a really interesting time to see how brands were going to use things um, like online advertising, which is really basically, you know, simple banner ads at that point and how they addressed innovation specifically in the media space. So I worked on brands like Procter and Gamble. I worked on Volvo. I worked on Intel, number of different, uh, brands that obviously have very large budgets, global footprints. And it kind of gave me a great understanding of just the diligence and the process of making advertising or marketing campaigns early in my life. So, you know, you, you, you worked uh, on a bunch of those type of advertising campaigns and, and you switched over to be an operator a bunch of times as head of marketing, head of growth, chief marketing officers and all of that. Uh, and now you are the CMO at Cherubundi uh, and an uh, operating officer at Emil Capital Partners. Can you explain a little bit, you know, what, what your roles and responsibilities are there? Sure. So my background, as you mentioned, you know, I transitioned from agency side to what they call client side or, you know, going inside of a company to run marketing on the, uh, on the branding side and, and was fortunate enough to sort of ascend through a number of consumer facing companies who were doing interesting things in a number of different categories that were very consumer facing, meaning they were answering trends and challenging big companies uh, because consumers were interested in different solutions. And I, and I think that's, you know, taking that motto, which is kind of going outside in, uh, both in terms of innovation, but also in just general marketing and positioning is how, you know, I then started to eventually meet Emil Capital Partners. And Emil Capital Partners early days was building an operating team. I was one of the first people to join the team 
to service a number of their portfolio companies, all of which, which is why I think they were attracted to me and I was interested in joining them, which are D2C brands in emerging spaces that are young and have tons of opportunity, but need some experienced operators to come inside the company and give them guidance. And then in addition to that, execute on the plan. And I think that's the difference between, say, consultants and advisors and true operators is they don't just give advice. And in my case, it's something that I actually prefer to do is the execution side of the role is really, really interesting. So I spend nearly 80% of my time operating inside of the company, uh, leading marketing, really working with a diverse set of executives, including, of course, all the different departments and, you know, partnering with innovation on a daily basis which is really where my role kind of balances in and sits is the idea of growth from the standpoint of top line, which every good startup does. And there's a number of different ways that, you know, good startups deploy growth marketing over time and then generating news and meeting consumers in new places with innovation. And when you combine those two things, that's basically what I believe good CMOs should be doing. And that's where I try to spend most of my time on a daily basis is in one of those two places. And so for, for listeners who don't know, can you share a little bit more about Cherubundi? Sure. So Cherubundi uh, is a late-stage startup. Um, we were founded actually in the early, mid-2000s. It's a company that is dedicated to tart cherry juice. And tart cherry juice is well-known in a number of different circles, but fairly unknown to the everyday athlete or the person who works out consistently. And what it is, is the superfruit juice that, con- that contains a bunch of all-natural anthocyanins or antioxidants to help recovery. And so it's, it's in over 50,000 stores. It's actually a pretty big business that candidly, not a lot of people have heard of. And so that is why they've asked me to lead this company in, in marketing is so we can get the word out, so we can educate the masses about the all natural benefits of tart cherry juice. And you have a bunch of different ways that you, you do this, which we'll, uh, we'll get into here in a little bit, partnering with Peloton instructors, supporting athletes, all sort of amazing things. To start off with, I mean, where's the kind of gap in knowledge in, in the market here? Where's the, the opportunity? Because it seems like um, with drinks, you know, like this, there are kind of a lot of, a lot of players that have been there a long time that, you know, a lot of brands that we're used to, um, but Rising brands like like Cherubundi that that need to get in front of more people have a really unique value proposition to offer. Have a really unique way to kind of change behavior and change habits. And I'm just curious, like how how where is the market at in terms of like being educated about this sort of thing? You know, it's a it's a really good question, and it's a really difficult one to answer. The truth is, is because one part of the market, which is amateur and professional sports teams, are well aware of the power of tart cherry juice, meaning we have over 300 professional and collegiate sports teams who are customers of our business and order the juice every month. And it has become almost common to find tart cherry juice and specifically Cherubundi in locker rooms all over the country. So to that degree, you know, we have built a business and found, as they say, product market fit in a really powerful way. Every NFL team but two all Power Five conference teams in collegiate sports, every national, uh, every NCAA football and basketball champion since 2007. The credentials are there. And that is one of the reasons why, candidly, I joined this company. I'm, I'm super excited the fact that we have such an interesting sports business. And we have a team that works in sports marketing. And we spend a lot of our team time talking to their nutritionists and their dietitians to understand trends, to get consumption behaviors, to make new products to help them drink more tart cherry juice and recover faster. But then you make this leap to what we call the everyday athlete, which is people who work out three plus times a week, who enjoy health and wellness, who are active in fitness. And to a large degree, awareness of of Cherubundi and tart cherry juice is in the single digits. And we've done some research to evaluate that. We know that there's a ton of upside and a lot of education has to go on to, but we have yet to cross into the mainstream by any means. And so that is why marketing and growth in particular is a huge emphasis to the company is we got to find ways to introduce this type of all natural recovery juice to the masses. Now you're right. We've done that in a couple different ways. We particularly work with a number of influencers. We call their, our, our program, the pit crew, you know, it's a clever little play. It's a name, nice. but we've branded it that way because it's legitimately the center point of our marketing plan. 
So to a large degree, you know, my philosophy in helping us educate the masses, you know, create the next big drink in the recovery space isn't to make ads. I'll be completely real with you. Like I have no desire to make advertising any longer in my career. And I've said this a number of times. This is my philosophy in general. I just don't think the world needs more ads. In fact, if you take a hard look at kind of the brands that are doing it best right now, the brands we love, one of them, which I'm wearing, right? Is Nike, is, you know, is Apple, all these big brands that everyone talks about and, is, and aspires to be like. And yet to a large section of that group and those companies, they don't make ads very often. They're great at PR, right? They have lots of interesting spokespeople. They have a certain point of view in the world, right? And all they do is find ways, unique ways to say that. And I think that's super interesting for brands and consumers are actually inviting them into their world. You know, I, I've stated this stat. I actually was at Instagram uh, not too long ago, and they, they're really proud of this stat that 80%, 80% of consumers follow a brand in their feed. Like that is a really interesting statistic, in my opinion, because it actually points to the relationship that consumers want to have with brands. And meaning they invite them into their lives like friends and family. And if brands will value that relationship, not with crappy ads, but actually interesting content, meaning brands sell stuff, grow, build relationships, you know, and consumers benefit. And so if we can change the paradigm at Sherabundi with our list of influencers via the pit crew, then I think we have a chance at educating the masses in a really interesting way. We'll dive a bunch into the, into the influencer strategy being the core of, of your marketing. But, you know, it, it makes me think of the, uh, the Cristiano Ronaldo deal that he did, um, which I think uh, it's lifetime deal. I think it pays him 20 million bucks or something like that. And I forget the, the exact number, but it's essentially, you know, like it's a contract worth a billion dollars. And I think that Nike got a billion dollars of earned media in the first year mm -hmm. from that contract. And you're just like, wow, this is, this is an incredible time to be a marketer when you can make those sort of bets. I mean, the LeBron James deal, I don't know what that's, you know, that's worth. I know obviously the, um, uh, the Under Armour, Steph Curry and Jordan Spieth deals back in the day were, were market setting. What, you know, Clay Thompson is doing for Anta is, mm -hmm. uh, is like unreal in terms of, uh, of the things that they can do for that brand. I mean, people follow, people follow influencers either, you know, big and small. And the crazy thing about it is that when you have an influencer, especially like in, in sports or something or wherever it is, um, or I will get to like Peloton instructors in a little bit here, but what's so crazy is you have this marketing machine behind them already and you have their own, you know, their own reach from that they can do through social media. And you can supplement that with all of the things that you want to do. And I just feel like it, it creates such an interesting portfolio of assets that a brand can have. Obviously it's expensive. It's very expensive uh, at times, but you can get a, a significant different approach than just say, Hey, we're going to keep buying ads over and over and over again. Yeah, that's exactly right. And all while, advertising has gotten more expensive, right? So it, that used to be Facebook and Instagram, you know, paid social used to be the cheap date for growth startups at any stage to reach consumers. And that's where we all ran early days to meet consumers and try to generate awareness and eventually conversion, right? And the unit economics looked really good. And then, you know, that time sort of ended and everybody said, well, what's next? And, you know, for a while there, you know, even pre-COVID, you couldn't throw a rock in the New York subway without hitting, you know, another startup ad. And so everybody ran to outdoor and everyone was looking for the next thing. And I, I think this is a really interesting natural evolution of, you know, now given that consumers demand, I don't think they just want, I think they demand to understand and have a relationship with a brand in a different way. And the best brands to meet them also want to associate themselves with characters, with people who align with their values. You know, that has created this, you're right, this perfect storm, this influencer economy, whether you're an athlete or a, just a person of interest that has a particular point of view or a certain style that uh, brands can now work with in much more collaborative ways. I mean, there's no question, right? Like Michael Jordan was like the OG of the influencer slash like economy in some way, right? Like he was first to co-creating a shoe. He's built a sub brand. He has his own brand, like 
And wow, that it's become so iconic as sort of the business model of choice for both influencers and for brands. And yes, LeBron has followed that. Steph has followed that. You know, everyone that is seemingly a, a superstar has a, 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 at least a sneaker deal. But then you fast forward that now and the trend that I actually see, and I see even as we talk to influencers, them being really interested in the idea of, you know, the Montclair Genius Program, which Montclair has created this essentially line that they call the Genius Program, where they work with a bunch of, you know, thought leaders. And they can be anything from sustainability to fashion to, you know, other types of things that really have no business to some degree touching an Italian luxury ski wear brand. And yet they've been able to do that because they've been pulling them into the supply chain or, or having them impact innovation. And now they, each of these ambassadors have their own sort of capsule collection with inside Montclair and their stores that stand for the values that each of these people sort of associate themselves to. And they're also featured in their ads. And they also use them for PR, right? And they also use them for sourcing different types of materials to go in their jackets and their ski wear. And so it's so integrated at this point that I think it's actually real. I don't think it's a commercial deal that they're just uh, stap, you know, slapping a billboard on your t-shirt and telling you to walk around. It's, it's something much more meaningful. Well, I think it's, it's so much more meaningful because the actual person can have a conversation. Like I think back in the day, we thought like people were selling out or whatever, right. like stuff like that the famous like Wayne's World thing. And they actually brought that back as an ad this year, mm -hmm. but the Wayne's World thing where it's like they're covered head to toe and like this idea is selling out. And I think younger generations, I don't think that's even in their vocabulary. I think the idea of selling out is like, wait, what? No, like go get the money. Like, yeah. you know, like that's, that's what everybody uh, talks about is, uh, and you know, people joke all the time about secure the bag, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I mean, Hulu made an entire campaign around how all of the athletes saying Hulu has live sports just so that they could get a bunch of money and like Dame Lillard and all these people. I mean, and, and we've, we've talked about the, the Travis Scott McDonald's thing. Right. I mean, people were selling their t-shirts that they were working in uh, McDonald's employees for like 800 bucks because they had the Travis Scott, you know, stuff. So I think that when you see those things as a marketer and you're like, those are the signals, right? Those aren't noise. These are, this is how, this is the new normal that you can do creative things. Another example, the, uh, pardon my take, which is like one of the top sports podcasts, they have a new, uh, sponsorship with, uh, with Coors Light and they post every, like every Friday, they, uh, they ask their fans to, uh, to post the mountains being blue and they get like thousands of people sending, like tweeting at them with like photos of Coors Light mountains being blue. And they have all that sort of stuff. They talk about Coors Light all the time. Like those are the type of things that I think are, they're real. That's a hundred percent real. Like obviously they're, you know, accepting a huge sponsorship, but they love those brands and they're happy to go above and beyond for them. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, you can see the Charlie deal with Duncan, right? Where she has her own coffee. Like, and the thing is, is it's not just, you know, a branding play, right? Companies are selling lots of stuff. I mean, McDonald's runs out of ingredients. There's actual real sales lift attributed to Charlie at Duncan. You know what I mean? Like, so for a long time, these were known as just kind of stunts. There were things that yeah. you could grab a headline, there was a new one of these every day and it was exhausting, right? Brands were trying too hard and it was obvious. Somewhere along the line, when they actually started working with versus just paying for different personalities, influencers, people of interest, the work got really interesting. It got better and it actually started to sell things. And like, that's where I'm just kind of like, I cannot understand. It, it is baffling to me why we still see so much bad advertising. Like, are, are we, have we got lazy? There's more than enough influencers in this world. Everyone's an influencer as far as I can tell. Not that influencers are the only option to make good content, but why can't we hold ourselves to a higher standard? Like I said, going back to it, like I learned inside of an advertising agency how to make advertising. And it's very obvious to me why it still looks like it does. And for sure, marketers aren't brave enough Brands don't want to, you know, offend anyone. Making, co-creating with another person who has their own opinion and their own brand is hard. It takes time. I think all of those sort of dynamics are in play. But I still can't allow myself to make bad ads. I, I, I just don't have, like, why bother at this point? And I, and I wish and I hope 
marketers, brands, and consumers all just demand more. And um, ideally, you know, we're seeing the media space evolve for sure to promote that type of content. You know, we're seeing obviously social media really value and um, promote engagement. So I think the space, I think consumers are all advocating. I think brands just need to stand up and do something worth watching. Yeah. And I think that they have to stand for something too. It's something that comes up a lot is like brands have to actually, and companies have to actually stand for something. And when they do, you, you see much, uh, much better engagement there as well. Right. If it, if it's just kind of, you know, faceless, nameless. Well, and so, and, and I'm curious, uh, you know, you came into the role and you obviously had a bunch of these thoughts already. So when you came into the role, like, what was your strategy to to do this? Did you did you undergo a, a full rebrand? Like, how did you think about you know setting this up from scratch and saying, okay, this is our go to market strategy? Yeah, the you know the interesting thing, which is both I think a blessing and a curse about young companies, is you know they just can't stand still. There's this race, and it's always a sprint, and it's can seem sort of exhausting. Change can't be generally revolutionary in a startup, particularly in marketing. It has to be evolutionary because you just have to keep publishing things. You have to keep testing and learning. You know, this game of aim, fire, aim, fire, aim, fire is what the best startups do and learn quickly from. And so when I joined Chair Bundy, I knew that we were not going to go through a rebrand overnight. We just didn't have the time to basically turn things off, take a back seat, fix it all and then launch it one day, you know, in the future. And so what we did in my strategy was, is first of all, you know, we needed the right partners. We have a roster of agencies. We took a look at them. It's not unusual for new CMOs to do that. And we made sure that we had the right people in the boat because we could be out there doing a whole bunch of things, but if we're not doing them well, then we're wasting our time. And so we made sure that, you know, our core team was the right people. And then in addition to that, we then said, okay, where are the channels that we can learn fastest? We knew that paid social was a place that we could speak directly to our consumers. We could get real-time feedback. We could understand what was working in terms of conversion. And so we just started to test new messaging. And so that gave us a lot of good data to say, okay, this positioning works. This positioning doesn't. These people like us. These people don't. Do we like these people liking us or do we actually want the other people? And we had to kind of go through this process of like self-evaluation. And some of it was pretty painful because you definitely, you know, are pulling back the curtain and saying, you know, do we like ourselves? And you can, if you've at all seen us from last year to this year, what you're going to see is we didn't like a lot of what we saw. And that's just me being super candid. Like we changed a lot. Now, again, going back to the fact that when I joined, the validation early on was 300 teams. And that is, you know, our proving ground. And so we said, okay, we know we have this. This is the crown jewel of the company. How do we magnify this? How do we put a microphone to these benefits? Because every one of these teams uses us for recovery. So let's anchor ourselves in recovery. But we need to do it in a way that feels more approachable. Not everyone can be a high performance athlete. Not everyone is going to play in the NFL, right? So we knew that people like me, and as you mentioned, people who write Pelotons, which for better or for worse is myself, you know, there's a lot of cliches that come with that, but I definitely got it. Uh, Peloton during COVID. I definitely focused on a lot of my own physical health and in doing so started to understand by just trying my own product. And so that started to also really help me understand, well, this is the way we need to think about change. And so so one step at a time, we changed, you know, we focused our primary audience, the everyday athlete. We then also said, hey, in addition to that, we're going to test and learn in paid social. And then we're going to start to reface and reskin these touch points of this brand. And we started with small influencers. We started with our core dietitians actually from our teams. So we got close to, we knew who the power users were. And then we just slowly have widened that net to now really try to use lifestyle brand cues to market what is a recovery product. And I think if you go to sharebundy.com right now, if you look at you know our own Instagram handle and look at who the influencers we work with, these are people who are not just high performance athletes, right? They are Peloton instructors. They are, you know, trainers to the everyday athlete. They are a number of health and wellness people that talk about the benefits and ways that drives education. And we're still in that journey, right? A year later, doing this step by step, 
I spend more of my time thinking about education because people still need to understand the benefits of tart cherry juice before they even think about buying Chair Bundy. And that's, that is the race. That is the sprint that we as a company are in right now is trying to meet the masses during that recovery moment. You know, it's so funny. I, um, I, I thought of this as soon as we, we were, uh, you know, booked to do the interview because I haven't had it yet. So this is next on my to-do list to try it out for recovery. And one of the things that, that kind of struck me was this, this, like the marketing, the like chicken or the egg question of like, do you lead with tar cherry juice? Or do you lead with the product, right? Mm -hmm. Or like essentially, you know, uh, lead with uh, with uh, the use case, which is which is recovery. And I and I think it's an, it's a really interesting thing because I think, you know, one is educating the market that like, hey, tart cherry juice is something that you might have never heard of and can help you recover faster. And the use case is of you're always looking for better ways to recover faster. You don't care what it is. You could, you know, I could tell you that it's, you know, ground up eucalyptus, eucalyptus leaves. If that, if that works, then you'd be happy about that. Um, and so it's kind of a funny thing to, that different people are kind of looking for, for different ways to solve the problem and which, which one do you, which one do you lead with? The thing that I asked a lot early on, and I think it's an important question for entrepreneurs all over the place is, and we talk about it a lot about it in food and beverage, but I think in general, you could talk about it in almost any brand is like, what's the occasion? Like, what's that moment that you want to create as what we call your recovery ritual? Like, where can you identify and anchor yourself? So like, and all of our trainers, by the way, and all of our dietitians stand by and say all the time, your workout isn't done until you recover. And yeah. so... What I learned very quickly was, and I wanted to know, I was like, how do I make this optimal for me? And it was very clearly said, oh, you drink it right at the end of your workout. And I'm like, oh, you know, that moment of shine, that sweaty moment when you, whether you're getting off a bike or finishing your run or done working out, like that's a moment, at least for me, I feel like a human again. You know, I feel, I feel like, wow, not only do I feel accomplished, I feel physically good, but it's also where I want people to remember to put Cherubundi in their hand. We're your workout accessory, right? And so from that standpoint, once I learned and identified that for myself and saw and heard everyone who drinks this juice to say the same thing, I said, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, if we're going to create an occasion or try to be part of someone's occasion, we probably need to tell them why before we tell them to buy us. Because me just piling into a conversation about recovery. People are like, who's this guy? This kind of oddly named cherry juice thing, what? And I, I recognize that. That feels a lot like advertising to me. Like you're the unwanted person at the party. No one invited you to be part of my YouTube you know, video and all of a sudden you interrupt in the middle. Like skip, I don't want anything to do with that. I knew we had to show up, be interesting, actually add value via education. And that is what we're actually trying to do. You know, all the influencers here is like, there's a huge recovery conversation going on in the world right now. Whether, you know, it's you're just recovering from what well, was 2020, which I think we all are to some degree, or, you know, you're reading about Russell Wilson and LeBron James spending over a million dollars each on their recovery rituals. Like Tom Brady says, recovery is more important than working out to him. Those things are, are so interesting that it used to just be about maybe do some stretching and then, you know, work out and drink some water. Hydration was a big part of the conversation. And now like we've come to a different chapter in this story where recovery is, is as important as the other two, warm-ups and workouts. And so from that sort of story is where I'm like, all right, this company has not just the potential, but this cultural moment that we can actually really add value. And the difference maker for us is that it's an all natural solution. You know, this is pure tart cherry juice from a tree in Michigan. And that is, you know, a distinctive factor or a really nice differentiator for us as a business. But we also know, and ECP's investment thesis is that all natural is better. And the portfolio of companies at ECP prove that. There are 30 plus different companies, many of them have all natural solutions in a ton of different categories. Cherubundi is a great example of why we believe the future is all natural, why we believe recovery is having a moment right now, 
And while consumers want both, and like you said, there has to be purpose. There has to be reason to, to actually show up and be interesting. And I think our brand has that. And I think consumers, you're right, expect that from young brands like ourselves. One of the things I love about the website, uh, which by the way, is fantastic. Love the, love the new website. I love the, the customer kind of, or the ambassador kind of case studies, exactly what you're describing, creating an occasion and then telling the story, letting people tell the story of their occasion of when they use it. It's so great. You know, you have uh, Jordan, who's the coordinator of nutrition for the San Francisco 49ers saying, you know, I include Cherubundi as part of my daily routine. You know, you have a doctor of physical therapy saying my daily at home recovery consists of rolling on a mobility ball, self stretching, uh, vibrating massage gun, and daily eight ounces of Cherubundi. Like, those are such vivid examples of how people do those things. And I think it's such a, it's such a great point that, like, when we tell customer stories, that so often, like the we what we want to talk about is is the idea of of the end state, right? What happened after they use the product? But what's interesting about those is it's actually when they use the mm-hmm. product because it, it makes it so much clearer in the in the customer's mind. Like for me, it's like I totally imagine myself at the end of a workout using it rather than like the kind of inspirational. It's like I lost ten pounds with Cherubundi. That's to me. That's actually less effective marketing because it's like kind of what everybody else says. And it doesn't really, it's like, okay, well, everybody wants to lose five, ta- five pounds. Sure, that works. But it's, an, it's totally an interesting uh, uh, take to think about, you know, creating that occasion and then marketing the occasion. We're lucky, right? Again, because I think we've, we were able to identify a moment in time, right? And, and actually, I think there's a number of other brands that we consider siblings to us, Hyper Ice being one of them, Whoop is another, that, are, that have also identified that moment. The only challenge that we have versus some of those companies that you know, also help specialize in recovery is recovery happens on the inside. So what we found is when we went first to shoot content and update the look and feel is if you photograph someone by themselves recovering, it's kind of a sad moment. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, a, it's a very introspective thing that you have to capture and it's, it, it doesn't play well by yourself. And so the, a lot of photography got felt forced because who's sitting around smiling by themselves, you know, that, that, that just feels awkward. It's kind of cringy. And so we're like, Oh, so what we learned is that recovery is best in groups. And I think that's true with people. You know, when you're done running at Barry's or you've just done a workout with your friends at the park, like a part of the fun is walking together back from wherever you just went. And it's that post-workout ritual and that celebration, that smiles, that's what recovery is all about. And, you know, that's so that's how we had to kind of navigate the occasion in itself and some of the learnings that we had to go through to be real, you know, to make something that uh, we felt like was good, not only wanting some, somebody, something somebody wanted to watch, but it was also true in that it wasn't forced. And it was something that people every day could easily associate to. You wrote an article recently for entrepreneur.com. You quoted one of uh, the things, one of the core tenets of Ian's marketing philosophy. And uh, I, was, I was fired up to read it because I, I talk about it all the time. So I say all the time that marketing has to be remarkable, uh, which means you have to actually talk about it to other people. Uh, it means it needs to like drive conversation and, and, and things like that. You said uh, a quote that your colleague told you that marketing was the tax you pay for being unremarkable. And I love that. That's a great quote. And what's, I think, tough for a lot of marketers is figuring out how to spread those remarks, how to... How to mm-hmm. Get those that accelerate word of mouth is what we hear a lot. So how do you think about that? How do you think about, you know, making your product remarkable and then getting people to actually talk about it? Yeah, I mean, the the best, I think, fastest way to make remarkable things is via innovation, meaning identifying what consumers really want or need and catering to that in a meaningful and impactful way. Now, not every brand can do that, right? But... I think if you start with the consumer, you're headed very quickly in the right direction. I think the wrong direction, which you see a lot of larger companies do, is 
you know, innovate via or from the supply chain. What can we make more of? What can we make better of? Not ever really thinking about, does anybody even want more or better of that thing? What that makes for is a lot of unremarkable products. It makes for a lot of expensive advertising because you have to convince people over and over that it's worth buying. And not only that, things like PR or media don't work hard for you because no one wants to talk about the thing you just made. And so I agree with you that smaller companies, challenger brands have to pick their spots. They can't be always on. It's hard to buy awareness and then create purchase intent and then conversion. So you have to do a lot of those things at once. And in order to do that, I would say we have chosen a couple of things. One is we are picking our spots. We have a product that we know you have to drink every day. You have to drink it eight ounces every day to feel the benefits of tart cherry juice, you know, which are about recovery. They're about immunity. There are a number of benefits if you drink it every day. And so one, yes, we focused on this occasion. Two, we focused on a number of verticals that we think we can go, you know, a mile deep and an inch wide in. So we're super focused with trying to educate a number of different audiences all around being the everyday athlete. And then the last bit, which is what I think makes every marketing plan look efficient is the value of PR. Every brand can buy advertising, right? They can find influencers, they can buy ads, they can be on social media. The best brands have a really interesting point of view. And that plays well when you are working with the press. Probably one of the most important lessons that I learned, and I consider probably some of the most impactful time in my professional career was at Method. You know, Method was very early to the CPG world. They were massively disruptive. They were fighting industry titans like Clorox and P&G. They had no business trying to win with that budget and, you know, with this little company in this huge category. And what they taught me and Eric... Ryan and, and Adam were amazing in this and that leadership team at Method really understood the values of that brand. But, you know, as I've said before, like they knew you couldn't just be one thing. And if you have a number of ways to be remarkable, you have the ingredients to help you share stories and be relevant in a number of different ways. Guess what? That tax you're paying is pretty low. And Method believed in four things. You know, they, they believed in fragrance they believed in efficacy, they believed in safe sustainability, and they believed in design. And those were the tenets of everything they did. And that is where, and that is the strategy I'm trying to bring to Chair Bundy. We need to be remarkable. One, in the product. The product has to be remarkable. I believe me, I don't want to work at a company where the product is flavored juice or sugar water. I'm not interested in doing those things. I want to work for a company that has a remarkable product. And I can scientifically prove that tart cherry juice is remarkable. So that's step one. Step two, we have to be different, right? We're all natural. In the performance category, there's a bunch of drinks that are based mostly on hydration, but candidly, aren't that great for you. And so we believe all natural is better, which is another way to be remarkable. So we have differentiation. So our benefits are real. Our differentiation is clear. Now we need to be a brand that inspires you and owns that recovery moment. And that is why we've leaned into influencers. That's why we identified this occasion about this ritual when you're done working out. And so I've taken some of these ingredients that I learned at Method and tried to uh, refine them, make them relevant for Cherubani today. Okay, let's get to our lightning round. These questions are fast and easy, just like marketing with Salesforce. You can go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more. They've been with us since the very first episode of Marketing Trends and every episode since. We love Salesforce. Go to salesforce.com slash marketing to learn more. Lightning round questions, Rob. Are you ready? Ready. Number one, I know you love them all. They're all your children. But what's your favorite Cherry Bundy drink? What, what should we try first? Pure, 100%. It's the one I drink every day. It's the most powerful Cherry Bundy product on the market. It has the most... Uh, antioxidants of any tart cherry product on the market in general. I love it. If you weren't in marketing or business at all, what do you think you'd be doing? One of two things. I've always wanted to be a tailor. It's a weird thing, but I hate baggy clothes. I hate it when clothes don't fit right. So I would love to be able to fix my own clothes. Uh, so I'd probably be a tailor. If not that, I'd probably be a caddy because I love golf. Excellent answers. Almost like you were ready for those. That was pretty good. 
Do you have a uh, best piece of advice for someone who is a first-time CMO? Work for a company that you love their product. Love their product. Like I, I, I just believe that life is too short to work on things you don't like. And I've been fortunate either to work at companies late in life that I chose to work at because I love their products and early on fell in love with the products of the companies that I joined unknowingly. And so at the intersection of, I love what I do, and I, I love the product that I work on, is this really interesting thing, actually, where mostly hobbies are born. And it's nice to feel when your job can feel like a hobby occasionally. Great advice. Is there a question that you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? It's an interesting question because nobody ever likes to talk about it. But this idea about money, like. I didn't get to where I've got because I took the job that paid the most money. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, when I came out of college, clearly advertising was not where most marketing people or even business people were going, right? Especially if you came to New York, you were going into, you were you're becoming a banker. You were working on Wall Street. You worked in finance. And that never appealed to me. Working in a creative field always interested me. It was always a hobby of mine in general. And... I just kind of followed that thread to the point where, you know, I was able to make a career out of it, but I never, I would like to be asked more about how decisions got made in my younger career because they were not very rational, but they were certainly born from, I want to be excited about getting out of bed and going to work every day. And I think that's important for people to pursue. Well, Rob, that's it. That's all we got for today. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, everybody should go check out Chair Bundy. I'm going to do it after this. I'm excited uh, to try it out. And uh, and Rob, I'll, I'll report. I'll report back to you. Any final thoughts? Anything to plug? No, I, I appreciate it. I, I definitely want everyone to visit ShareBundy.com. Learn a little bit more about tart cherry juice. Read our reviews on Amazon if you don't believe us. And you know. Be open to trying new things. I think for those of you that work out every day, myself included, like recovery is a really, really important thing, especially in this day and time. And, uh, you know, I want everyone to stay well. Couldn't agree more. And uh, now it reminds me I need to work out this month. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, been a, it's been a long one. Awesome. Thanks again, Rob. Yeah, thanks again. Marketing Trends Podcast is brought to you by Salesforce. Discover marketing built on the world's number one CRM, Salesforce. Put your customer at the center of every interaction. Automate engagement with each customer and build your marketing strategy around the entire customer journey. Salesforce, we bring marketing and engagement together. Learn more at salesforce.com slash marketing.